Hello and welcome to Sparda Alliance, your one-stop destination for the civil services preparation, UPSC, KPSC and other relevant examinations. As we had told you in the past, we are also keenly looking at some of the important articles from Deccan Herald as well. Apart from the Hindu analysis that we do, we also pick up some of the important articles if it is required for your UPSC and KPSC examinations. Today, apart from two articles that we have picked up from the Hindu, we have also taken up Deccan Herald articles as well. So what are you waiting for? Hit the like button, subscribe to our YouTube channel and let's get started. The first article here is speaking about the IITs in India. The IITs are overcommitted and is in crisis, says the author. What is the author trying to say? The author is trying to say that when we speak about distinguished universities or the institutions in India, one of the distinguished institutions in India happens to be the Indian Institute of Technology. Name it and then every single person whosoever is understanding of the in technology will know that Indian Institute of Technology has contributed a lot to the education as well as the innovation on the technological front. Number of people who have been people who have studied in the Indian Institute of Technology have made India proud as well, not just in India, but then you also have people world over as well. Number of innovations have taken place and these people also represent the Indian diaspora. When we take the examples of the Indian Institute of Technology and its people who have studied it, we have Sundar Pichai who happens to represent Google is from the Indian Institute of Technology. Raghuram Rajanji happens to be a person from the Indian Institute of Technology. Similarly, we have many people who have made couple of startups as well. They are all from Indian Institute of Technology. For example, it can be Flipkart. So you have many people who are coming up with innovations. So one institution which has always had some representation where the world recognizes is the Indian Institute of Technology. So the author goes on to say, yes, Indian Institute of Technology has represented us. It has created new innovations as well. One brand that people world over are able to recognize in terms of the educational front for the India happens to be the Indian Institute of Technology. The author also brings into picture that there is a lot of competition for this Indian Institute of Technology, which means to say there are a million people competing just for about 20,000 odd seats in India. And this happens to be one of the toughest examinations in the country. And do note, if you are giving the UPSC examinations, UPSC examination is also one of the toughest in our country as well. So apart from IITs, what we have is NEET exam and UPSC exam is also one of the toughest. So if you are giving this exam, you are cracking a tough nut. So give it your best and you will succeed and reach the doors of Labasna. And when we speak about IITs, the fact that we have to understand is that IITs of late have taken up a new program. What is this new program? They are opening up branches, not just in India, but they are also opening branches outside India as well. Why? That is because a couple of people say that this represents the soft power. This also represents the way that the Indian Institute of Technology wants to develop education in other countries, be supportive to other countries as well. One such branch that we have is a branch campus of IIT Madras, which is just open in Zanzibar and IIT Delhi will be launching programs from its Abu Dhabi campus in the year 2024. So we have two programs. One is in Zanzibar. Where is it? It is in Africa. The other happens to be IIT Delhi's program, which will be in Abu Dhabi. The tiny first entering class of 70 students has been accepted. Now the question is, since they are opening up branches in Zanzibar, that is they will have a programs which will be similar to that of the IITs in Zanzibar and IIT Delhi will also open a program in Abu Dhabi campus in 2024. There are a couple of questions that are lined up. What are these questions? When we say that programs will be started in Zanzibar and in Abu Dhabi, are the faculty members of these institutions, that is IIT Delhi or IIT Madras, Will these people make a visit to those campuses as well? This is the fundamental question that one needs to answer. So who are the faculty members who will go there, train them, provide them the education that is required? So it is at this particular point, there is a confusion. So in all likelihood, these faculty members may not visit Zanzibar or Abu Dhabi, which ultimately means 
questioning the credibility of these programs so apparently when you look at the campus right now it is under renovation we do not have enough laboratories as well we do not have a um, basic amenities that is required for the informational technology institution to flourish so the question that is being asked is that iit programs are being run in some other countries and some other campuses as well similar programs are being run in that case will the faculty members go there and teach and do we have all the required amenities that is required for the renovation and innovation if not why come up with a program yes the intent of this particular program is to ensure that we have a soft power reach in another country but do we have enough resources at our disposal to ensure effective efficient discharge of the duties in that particular case if it is to expand india's soft power if we are not able to do justice this will ultimately bring a remark which may not be right says the author that's the first question the second question that the author tries to bring is the first iit was established back in the year 1950 at karakpur in west bengal with four more following in a decade most of these partnered with the top foreign technological institutions initially as we opened up the indian institutes of technology what we required was the support and guidance why because we were opening some of the standard institutions which will be the stalwart for the future science and development technology so what we required was assistance so what did india do india brought in some of the people who were aware of how to run science and technology institutions it sought the assistance from united states of america germany russia so on and so forth so that it could become a platform for the future generation as well as for the science and technology platform in the country so it sought assistance from multiple countries world over so initially when it started off it had limited numbers so it had 5 to 6 institutions across the entire country and most of these were based in the metropolitan cities so if we take the major iits that we have let's say for example iit madras iit bombay iit karakpur then we have iit couple of other iits as well these are basically framed or placed in such metropolitan cities where the faculty members would want to come and also teach the students as well but then off late we have couple of iits that we have created and these iits are also in the remote corners and some of them are also not in the metropolitan cities they are in the tier 2 cities the intent is that these cities also develop that is a very good intent but the other problematic point is the faculty members may not go to these tier 2 cities because they do not want to face troubles because when you look at the metropolitan city they would have everything at their disposal they would have the infrastructure that is required they would have the schools and colleges and also all the health related amenities as well for their family members but when it comes to the tier 2 cities it is present but at the same time it is not as far fetched and as good as the tier 1 cities and as a result these faculty members may not go to the tier 2 cities is the second major issue so when we look at the faculty members the faculty members have to be paid more initially when this particular indian institute of technology started there were number of people who had studied in the foreign universities these people had an idea as to how a foreign institution works how the science and technology domain works and ultimately they came back to india and they also started working with the indian people as well as the indian students as well because they had taken pride for themselves and now what we have is because we do not have because we have created too many institutions these faculty members will mostly go to the metropolitan area they may not go to the tier 2 cities and as a result good faculty members may not be present when good faculty members are not present the intent of the indian institute of technology or the institution the standards may drop as well so you have the students the students are the ones who also make up the what the institution is how well the institution is how the reputation of the institution is since most of the top ranking individuals or the students who pick up this particular college usually go to iit bombay or iit delhi or iit madras or iit karakpur so on and so forth these students may not also select tier 2 cities as well because they do not have enough infrastructure according to them and as a result what we have is issues in the iit 
One, the major issue is there is similar programs that IIT is planning to run at the international institutions, for example, in Zanzibar or in the Abu Dhabi campus. Now, the question is, if this is the reach of the soft power, do we have enough expertise? Our, student, our faculty members from these institutions like IIT Bo Delhi as well as IIT Chennai going there to teach? No. If that is a no question, then the standards may drop. First question. The second one is with respect to the faculty where we do not have enough faculty members who would be able to go to the tier 1 cities teach them because they would have got the exposure of the international universities when we do not have the faculty increasing the number of IITs may not be a good idea second because the standards may drop and third most of these students who select will only select the top tier 1 institutions and they may not select the tier 2 cities IITs and as a result the standards may drop so it would not be an exaggeration to say that IITs are in crisis. Building quality in the new IITs is a significant challenge and it is a long run and if this is not done, the prestige of the entire system will suffer, says the author. It is this that we have to understand with respect to this article. Now let us look into the next article. This article says a retrograde step. The article here is speaking about initiatives that have been taken by couple of state governments where they are fact checking few facts which they feel may be a fake news. What is fake news? Let me explain this with the help of an example. Let us say for example, we have too many people who say that so and so person has graduated from WhatsApp University. What do we understand by that? That means there is a information that is being shared and this information that is shared on the WhatsApp is not authenticated, has not been validated, may also be false as well without even realizing that this happens to be a false information, fake information and information which is not right. We tend to forward this information to other section of the people assuming for the fact that this happens to be a legitimate information. So without verifying transferring or sending this information to another person through whatsapp is what is called as whatsapp university message with a negative tinge attached to it that this person has not validated this information has not looked at this information on an online platform validated it rechecked it and authenticated without doing any of these assuming that this is the right information true information assumes it to be right he assumes and gives this information to some other person without validating it. That is what is called as fake news or a message from WhatsApp University. So basically, what is fake news? It is an information or assumed fact which may not be right, which may not be correct, which may not be true, which is not authenticated. And this has a specific agenda when it comes to the society. So let us say for example, they want to break a community's understanding let's say there is one community specifying one religion then there is another community which has a practices of a different religion now they want to create a chaos between these two different communities so what do i do create a fake narrative transfer it on for whatsapp or on any of the social media platforms there have been examples as well where there have been people who have just gone to a village and there was a fake news that was sent that there are people who are coming to kidnap the children so what happened just because there were new individuals who happened to vi visit that particular village with an apprehension and a fear and a phobia that these are the people who are coming to kidnap the children. They were killed and they were lynched and they were beaten black and blue. Why? Because there was a narrative that was sent that these are the people who are kidnappers of the children without authenticating it, without realizing the information, without actually me looking at that information whether it is right or wrong. I validate that information. I presume it to be right and ultimately there have been uncalled incidents, illegal incidents that have taken place. So what is fake news? Fake news is that information which may not be right but has taken the validation that it is right and ultimately people are convinced that it may be right and then they ultimately take actions in order to picturize that this is the right information. So this fake information has become a major problem world over. It is not just restricted to India. It has, it has 
hit the world community as well so in order to overcome the issue of fake news and that too with the increase of the artificial intelligence we do have fake news as well these fake news are increased by the narratives of something called as the deep patterns as well and ultimately people are getting convinced and are also convinced by these fake news so in order to overcome these fake news we have couple of uh, initiatives that are taken by the private organizations let's say for example we have twitter now it is called as x then we also have facebook now it is called as meta then we also have couple of other institutes like youtube so on and so forth what do they do let's say for example i happen to be a party so i am a person who is writing something on uh, twitter or i am a person who is writing something on meta or facebook so if there is an information that i write this will also be checked by that team for example if I'm posting something, an image or let's say I'm writing a write-up on Facebook or on Twitter, what do I do? I write something which may aggravate the circumstance or create instability in the environment. So immediately the internal institution of Twitter or Facebook will see if this information is right or wrong. So if it is right, they will allow it and they will retain that particular information on their platform. But if it is wrong, if it is fake or it may not be right in that particular case, they may red flag it as well. Well, they may also say that this is a sordid story, a cooked up story, a dirty story that is created and they may also issue a red flag as well. And when there is red flag in that particular platform, it means that information may not be right. This is happening on Twitter. This is happening on Facebook. This is happening on social media platforms. So these institutions, that is the private institutions as a whole, they have taken up their own kind of couple of initiatives so that fake news can be rooted out and similarly what we have is government which has also taken steps to call certain facts as facts which may be right and it has also taken up initiatives to say that there are certain facts which may also be wrong this is where we had the central government which had earlier come up with changes to the IT rules which amended the information technology rules of 2021 allowed the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology to appoint a fact checking unit. So several parties are looked into it and they also criticize this initiative of the central government. Why? Let's say for example there is an information that the government has released. Whether this information that the government has released or any person has spoken about the government, whether it is fact or not will be decided by the government. What if I happen to be a newspaper? What if I happen to be an individual who does care about the society? I happen to become the fourth pillar of the democracy, which is the media. And if I happen to question the credibility of the government source, then if the government says that source itself is fake, or that is not right and if it is fact checking and marks my article or my information as a red flag or a fake narrative then in that particular case the government is going against free speech as well let's say for example the government has taken up one of the initiatives and this particular initiative is not right so what do i do i write an article i am a person who is an activist i write an article on the social media platform or i am a newspaper i write this article on one of the newspapers so what does the fact checking unit of the government do the fact checking unit says that this particular article written by this individual is not right this article that is written by this newspaper is not right so the government is checking this article and information and marking it as a red flag if the government goes on to mark this article or an information time after time that this is a red flag in that case it is violating my freedom of speech and expression so ideally this should be left to autonomous institutions this should be left to the free bodies as well where they would be able to check and validate this particular claim if the government is doing it time after time repeatedly targeting a specific organization a newspaper outlet or an individual it will have an agenda and that agenda has to be rooted out so what we have is misinformation an information which may not be right and in this particular case if the government 
is constantly targeting an individual or a me news media outlet that is not right says this article so similarly now what we have is a tamil nadu government which has taken a decision a fact checking unit to deal with misinformation and disinformation pertaining to the state government emanating from all media platforms sounds on the face of it a reactive step so if there is a media outlet or an individual who is writing against the government the government will see if it is fact or not if it is against the government they will say that this is not a fact and ultimately this is a violation of the fourth pillar's rights which is against the media rights and what we require is judicial oversight and a monitoring at this particular moment so yes there is menace of misinformation there is fake news that is being selected and it is being propagated but then what we need is an independent autonomous institute a judicial oversight on all these fake news and misinformation but this should not be done by the government what if there is genuine information what there is there is a policy failure what if the law and the rules that are designated and created by the government is not right so i have the right to question the government in that point this is a violation of article 19 freedom of speech and expression if i'm not allowed to act independently so only those independent fact checkers and autonomous institutions should work for the pride of the country and the government should not interfere and should not constantly hit a particular group or an organization is what is this article all about now let's look into the next article this article here is picked up from the deccan herald as we told you so this article primarily goes on to speak about we did discuss about the pegasus software in our recent daily current affairs discussion we did discuss that apple has made recommendations to couple of celebrities as well as activists that their phones are getting hacked and they have to update the operating system or their application so now the question is how do we understand if our phone is hacked or not remember this can be very important from your gs paper 3 which is internal security where we have a concept called a social media we also have cyber security as well so it becomes very important in those two papers so how do we know whether our phone is compromised or if there is a hacking attempt that has taken place if you notice any unusual activity let's say for example you know for the fact that you have sent messages to so and so person or you have whatsapp so and so person what if there is a message that you have not sent and someone has sent it from your phone that is an aspect of hacking or there is an extra activity on your phone so messages that you didn't send deleted items that you didn't delete a purchase activity that you don't recognize is a clear sign of the account that is being hacked if you don't message or you haven't sent the message to anyone that is a clear sign and at the same time if you have deleted items let's say for example you have a photo that you have kept as a screenshot and this would have been a proof so someone has deleted the photo someone has deleted the message someone has deleted the video that you had as a proof in your phone that is a clear sign of hacking or let's say for example you have purchased something let's say you have an application and application has automatically been put to your phone and they have purchased it from your credit card as well so if there is app purchase or any other purchase that has taken place on your phone that is also leading to the compromised phone if your password no longer works on your device was locked or placed in lost mode that is a symbol of hacking if you have an unfamiliar application that is a symbol of hacking that is you did not download an application but then in the the phone automatically has that application that is an hacking if your phone is consuming too much internet data than usual that is a compromise so if you are using the android or the ios bring these changes abnormal fast draining of the battery at random times is an example of hacking on phones whenever an app is using a camera or mic without your permission it lights up an orange or the green dot light inside the front camera that is when there is an hacking or when gps is being used an arrow appears on the top of the screen you have not given permission to that particular application to know where your location is despite that when you open the application it automatically starts looking at the location that is a compromise that is where hacking might have taken place so whenever there are such scenarios that have taken place we have to be very careful 
and we have to safeguard it as well so how do we safeguard always install applications only from official app store or google play store ensure your data is updated to the latest software version and security framework which means to say that you have to update your phone every now and then there will be security patches that will be released operating system will have to be upgraded as well we have to use a strong passcode and always try to change it often as well and we need to have the two-factor authentication what is this two-factor authentication let's say for example you go on gmail i'm giving you a simplest of example so what do you have you have your user id then you also have the password as well apart from the user id and password that you have you can also give the second factor authentication which basically means an otp will come to your phone so there will be a otp which will be sent to your mobile number and only after you give this otp number you will be able to validate so the first important factor is that you give the id and the password which is the first source of authentication and after that you also give a prompt that there is an otp that comes to your mobile phone number and after this is when you will realize for the fact that you have the second factor authentication that is two layers of security ensure the email id is linked to your phone number and secondary email id this will greatly help in recovering the hack account so in case you see any of the suspicious activity that is taking place so you can immediately dial hash 002 hash on phone to completely disable call and message forward feature so if you are able to do so you can keep a check on the activities of your phone is what is this article all about so this is an article that is picked up from the in that is picked up from the Deccan Herald newspaper and whenever you log in to your account using Apple ID or Gmail ID the user gets notified through the official or the personal email ID if it is not used review the devices and delete it immediately if you find any unfamiliar application on the phone which is consuming cellular data delete it immediately be very careful when you're clicking URL in an email or an SMS so if it is an unknown message or an email that you're not sure who has sent it just ignore them or immediately delete them or immediately block them do not even respond to those people even on whatsapp is where well. these days you have number of people who will message you ask you you are so and so so person can i contact you for the work no don't even give importance to it the minute you get such message which you have no idea about who that person is immediately block that person and report it to whatsapp as well never ever share your financial credentials on email or sms or on phone calls to any person you know out of the blue if you receive any job offer or saying that you have received a paycheck of 1 million dollar or 1 million rupees don't even accept that and in case you are out on a public transform let's say for example you go to a railway station there is free wi-fi don't use the free wi-fi to involve the digital cash transfer use your personal data that is the 4g or the 5g data but never use the public wi-fi for the digital cash transfer these are some of the recommendations that needs to be followed to prevent the hacking or illegal activities on your phone it is this that we have to understand with respect to this article now let's look into the next article this article here is speaking about apec what is apec apec here happens to be one of the international organizations which stands for the asia pacific economic cooperation the asia pacific economic Op cooperation was founded in Canberra in 1989 and it was an informal dialogue forum to promote regional economic in integration. It was initially started with 12 members and today we have as many as 21 members. So remember from the preliminary examination point of view we have as many as 21 members right now in the Asia Pacific Economic Forum and what does it do? It helps in economic integration in the Asia Pacific region by promoting free trade throughout the Asia Pacific region. Who are the members? The members include Australia, Brunei, Canada, Chile, China, Hong Kong, Indonesia, Japan, South Korea, Malaysia, Mexico, New Zealand, Papua New Guinea, Peru, Philippines, Russia, Singapore, Taiwan, Thailand, United States and Vietnam. Is India part of APEC? No. So if in case there is a question which says that APEC, India is part of APEC? No. India is not part of APEC. And how do they work? 
when it comes to APEC, it operates on the basis of non-binding commitment, which means to say there are no binding commitments. So there are no restrictions that are placed. Everything happens on a voluntary basis. So they decide everything on a consensus. So a question would be asked in the APEC and ultimately whether this has to be selected, implemented or not will depend on the consensus. Even after that point has been accepted, it is not binding on them, which means it is voluntary in nature. It is not mandatory by nature and all decisions are reached only by consensus and commitments taken on a voluntary basis. And remember, when it comes to this Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation, it is not countries which become part of APEC, but it is economies which become part of the APEC. That is why Hong Kong, which is in China, is also part of the APEC. And at the same time, we also have Taiwan as well, which China says is part of China, but Taiwan is also part of APEC, which means that it is not countries as a whole, which are part of the APECs, but instead you have economies. Taiwan has an independent economy. Hong Kong has an independent economy. So economies are part of this organization. So it is unique in this grouping that economies rather than nations allowing participation of the Chinese ruled Hong Kong as well as the self ruled Taiwan, which China claims as its own. It does not include India, however, the world's most populous country. So whenever there is this APEC which happens on an annual basis, so countries organize it. One of the countries become the host countries. Let's say for example, we have United States of America which is a host or Australia which is a host or Brunei which is a host. So whosoever is visiting that particular country, they will also have to embrace the culture. So for example, if there is an outfit that is in, with respect to a particular culture of that country all these countries individuals and the country's leaders who visit that country will also have to wear the local traditional outfit as well that happens to be the unique feature of this APEC for example if they visit Brunei there will be a particular local culture they have a local outfit as well so leaders from all countries will wear this local outfit that happens to be a unique one so what are the objectives of the Asia Pacific region so the objectives of the Asia Pacific region is basically to enlarge on the uh, economic front. So we have couple of economic issues, trade related issues, economic issues, for example, what should be the exports, what should be the imports, what is the limitation that needs to be embraced on the taxation front, how much taxation should happen, whether there will be a free trade agreements between all these countries, what are the international base, rules based order, everything are part of this economic region, that is economic integration. To implement it, what we have is a structure. First, what we will have is the leaders meeting. Then what we will have is the APSC Business Advisory Council, which will look into the regional economic integration, sustainability, MSME, finance and digital working group. Then we will have the ministerial meeting. And then what we will also have is a sectoral ministerial meeting. Under the ministerial meeting, what we will have is a friends of the chair, policy partnership which is about food security so on and so forth and under the ministerial meeting we will also have committee on trade and investment budget management committee economic committee sdm committee which discusses about policy partnership working group so on and so forth so how are we going to implement it further and further is what is the structure all about so basically when we speak about the apec remember we do not have india in the apec why is India not part of it? That is because India initially was a closed economy up until the 1990s and only after the 1990s we kind of opened up our economy. So India was denied APMC membership primarily because the, our economy was not integrated to the global economy which is why it was denied and there was lack of consensus. Initially there were about 12 members then it increased to about 21 members and there was lack of consensus between the countries as to how we incorporate India into this and China was also not happy about it. It was also obstructing as well. There was no consensus about how members will have to be adopted into this particular grouping and at the same time India also had a large trade deficit as well. Looking at all these aspects India was not involved in the APEC and it is yet not part of the APEC. And now we have couple of concerns with respect to the APEC and what are the controversies. 
Hong Kong's representation has become controversial. Why? Because there was a person who is an important personality from Hong Kong and he was put under the United States, United States of America's human rights actions. So Hong Kong may not be present. The Hong Kong government said Lee would not attend due to scheduling issues and financial secretary would go to Fr San Francisco instead. Russia's participation became divisive after it invaded Ukraine. So Russia may participate or may not participate because many countries are against Russia in this particular case and then drafting a final summit declaration this year will be difficult due to divisions between members over conflicts in Ukraine and Middle East and since we have the APEC meeting and the conference that is taking place which will be taking place in one hour how are we going to discuss the larger communique what is the communique it is an outcome of that particular conference and a meeting so at the end of this conference what is that we have decided and what is that we are going to implement that will be decided in the communique and the final summit declaration but in this particular case we have crisis that is brewing in middle east in israel and palestine crisis then we have had russia invade ukraine as well so which has led to large scale human rights violations in both these conditions so how are we going to accept and frame one consensus is the question. In Bangkok, leaders endorse a text vowing to uphold and strengthen a rules-based multilateral trading system while noting most of them condemn Russia's war in Ukraine. And then we also have a couple of issues where given the makeup of APEC with Russia and China, both members, it's more difficult than ever before to come with the tangible outcomes. So you have Russia and China on one side, couple of other countries on the other side. What is the conflict? What are the issues on the base of ideology? And all this will be be discussed as part of this APC. So we have APC which is coming up in the next few days. So once we have that coming up, we will take up the outcome of the APC. As of now, this is all you have to understand with respect to this article. Now let's look into the next article. This article again is taken from Deccan Herald. So this article here is speaking about US daylight saving. What is US daylight saving? Let's say for example in summer months, let's say the time is 9 a.m. This 9 a.m. will be shifted to 10 a.m. which means to say that there will be expansion of time to next one hour. That is the time actually might have been 9 a.m. but the clocks will be turned one hour that is forward which is called as the daylight saving. Basically, that will be done so that they can save on the daylight. Why was it introduced and when was it introduced? When we speak about daylight saving, it is the practice of moving clocks forward by one hour during the summer months. So daylights last longer into the evening. So even at around 7 p.m., what we will have is a broad daylight to utilize it, to save on the energy, to conserve the energy and make use of it. What we have is daylight saving. This daylight saving is practiced in North America as well as in Europe. The practice has been controversial from the outset with many countries having adopted and rejected multiple times. Egypt announced it in March. It reintroduced daylight saving time after a seven year gap. Japan considered adopting the practice for the 2020 Olympics but rejected the proposal. When does daylight saving end in the year 2023? Daylight saving time in the United States and some neighboring countries will end on November 5th at 2 a.m. local time. In the UK and the European countries, daylight saving time, also known as summer time, ended on October 29th. Why was daylight saving created in the US? The modern idea of changing the clocks with seasons can be traced back to the 19th century when New Zealand entomologist Don Hudson proposed it to conserve the energy and extend the daylight hours. So this is basically done in order to save the energy where we can make use of the natural light rather than the artificial light. That is why daylight saving came into the picture. So we have this topics that we have discussed for today's discussion. So this is it for today. Thank you for watching. All the best.